Uh, Matthew 14, 22 to 36. Kids, you've got Jesus, you've got a boat, you've got Peter. Do the actions as I read the passage, okay? Do the actions as I read the passage. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already over a mile from land, battered by the waves because the wind was against them. Around three in the morning, he came toward them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, command me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, truly, you are the son of God. Once they crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. When the men of that place recognised him, they alerted the whole vicinity and brought to him all who were sick. They were begging him that they might only touch the tassel on his robe, and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, There are going to be a lot of who is questions over the next 10 weeks. That's my token political example for today. But I want to turn to a really important question. Who is Jesus? I don't know how often you ask that question. I don't know how often you answer that question. I don't know how often you actually address that question to someone else. But it's really the fundamental question for who we are as Christians, isn't it? Who is Jesus? Now, let me tell you, it's a question we should never get tired of asking and we should never get tired of answering. It's a question we actually need to pose to our world. We need to ask our friends sometimes even strangers, workmates as well. And the answer will bring a world of responses. In this part of Matthew's Good News biography, it's the question he asks almost in every verse. Who is Jesus? And we're going to look at that today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, This is a passage that I have grown too familiar with. And I want to thank you for the way in which you've worked this week to remind me of how astounding it is. Father, we pray that you'll do that with all of us today. A passage that we know, a conclusion that we understand. But Father, remind us of how awesome it is that the Son of God walks on water and hops in the boat. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, now, I actually turned up to this passage. I thought, yep, sermon, that's pretty neat and tidy. I can jot this one. I was reminded this week of how familiar I am with a passage like this. How familiar I am with a passage like this. And it's actually been good for me this week. I don't know whether it'll be good for you as we do it now, but I hope it is. It's been good for me this week to be reminded of a number of threads that Matthew lays out in his Good News biography of Jesus and starts to bring together at this point. Remember last week we recapped about why this is a good news biography of Jesus. Remember last week I reminded you of the key idea. Let me say it again. God provides new beginnings through his promised King Jesus who brings the outsiders in. And as Matthew puts that idea in front of us, he lays out three threads. The first is this. It's the question of Jesus' sonship. Now, you could debate that in all sorts of ways. His paternity was debated in the day and he was dismissed and it's often the case today. But it's surprising how often son is mentioned. It's there in the first verse. The son of David, the son of Abraham. 
Uh, it's obvious in the birth accounts. He'll give birth or she'll give birth to a son. It's there as they flee into Egypt and then come back. It's clear in the revelation at the baptism of Jesus when God quotes his own words from Psalm 2. When Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, where does the devil attack him? If you are the son of God. As the demons recognise Jesus everywhere, that's how they describe him. As the crowds marvel at his miracles in Matthew 12, they say perhaps this really is the son of David. Everywhere you look in Matthew, the sonship of Jesus is a key question. The second thread is the way in which people change in their understanding of Jesus, the way in which they grow the way in which they're offended, the way in which they're puzzled. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you know, that opening section there in Matthew 5, 6 and 7, the crowds are astonished. By the time we reach Matthew chapter 8, they've started to work out that you can ask stuff of Jesus. When he calms the storm in the boat in Matthew 8, 27, his disciples are scratching their heads. They know he's significant, but they say, who is this man? By the time we get to Matthew 12, the authorities want to wipe him out. And when you get to his own town in Matthew 13, they've come to the conclusion that he's a carpenter who's gotten above his station in life. But you notice the way in which when people look at Jesus, they respond and change and develop in their understanding. And those two threads, sonship and their understanding of Jesus, come together in this question. If this is who Jesus is, how's he going to use his power? If this is who Jesus is, how's he going to use his power? That's the question asked in the desert, isn't it, when the devil tempts him? If you're the son of God, well, you've got some flash powers. Why don't you turn those rocks into bread? Why don't you act like every other king in history who's abused his power? And time and again, the devil poses that question, doesn't he? If you're the son of God... And isn't it remarkable that every time Jesus reveals his identity, he uses his power in line with his identity. He doesn't abuse it, does he? We saw that last week. All the crowds come to him. They're desperate. They're in need. They're hungry. What does Jesus do? Bow down. I'm your king. He showers them with compassion and he cares for them. So those three threads are woven together today, sonship, identity, and the growth in understanding, and how does Jesus use his power? Look at verse 22 with me, Matthew chapter 14. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already over a mile from land, battered by the waves because the wind was against him. The feeding of the 5,000 men has been accomplished. It's late in the day. What will Jesus do? What will Jesus do? Jesus will make his disciples go away. Jesus will dismiss the crowd. Jesus will go and be on his own. Can you think of any other king or political leader in the world who would do that after feeding the 5,000? <laughs> there'd be press releases, there'd be polls, there'd be policies, there'd be focus groups, there'd be headlines, there'd be snap news reports. Instead, Jesus makes his disciples. It's really forceful language. He makes his disciples get in a boat and go away. He dismisses the crowd and he goes on his own. Why would he do that? Well, listen to the same account in John's Good News biography. John chapter 6, verse 14. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this really is the prophet who was to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew. The crowd's already worked out who he is, hasn't they? Uh, This is the son of David. They've put two and two together and they've worked out that this could be the bloke 
to kick the Romans out. So let's grab him, whack a crown on his head, put a sword in his hand, and let's have a revolution. The disciples are only just starting to twig, so they're in danger of being sucked in by the crowd. And let me tell you that if Jesus truly is a man like you and me, he would be tempted by that power, wouldn't he? And so Jesus acts in incredible discipline, doesn't he? He sends the disciples away so they're not misled. He removes the crowd so that they don't fall into violent revolution. And then he withdraws himself. And what does he do? He goes away and prays. This is a boy who's dependent on his dad. Isn't that remarkable? He is remarkably disciplined in that dependence. He doesn't grab the crown or the sword, but he falls to his knees alone and prays and redirects and comes in dependence on his father. But in case you think that this is random, he's actually sent the disciples to a place where they're going to learn more about him. Where, where are they at this moment? Uh, look there in verse 24. They're a mile off land. They're battered by the waves and the wind is against them. It's slow going. And let me tell you, if it's hard to deal with water that's in a tub at the front of the church... It's even harder to deal with water that will sink your boat. And in the wee hours of the morning, at the end of a day where it's been full of teaching and healing and feeding, verse 25, around three in the morning, he came toward them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. We are so familiar with that, aren't we? We just, we just kind of, yep, next scene. It is a wild storm. They have been rowing for hours and they're only 1.6 kilometres offshore. Everything is against them and Jesus comes to them. How does he come to them? Walking on water. You're meant to notice it because it's in the present tense. It's kind of put in the foreground for you so you don't miss it. He came to them walking on water. Only one other bloke in the Bible walks on water. Who is it? It's God, isn't it? Job chapter 9 verse 8, Psalm 77, 19. God alone is the one who leaves footsteps in the water, on the water. The disciples, they're petrified. They think it's a ghost. Can you imagine how exhausted they are? They have been rowing since the sun set and it's 3 a.m. They're fearful, they're exhausted, and they don't recognize him. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And again, present tense, speaking in your face. And we've got to take both the image and the word together. The image alone is remarkable, isn't it? Walking on water. Please take time today to think about how amazing that is. And then he speaks. He reassures them. He cares for them. He says, hey, fellas, it's me. It's me. But it's bigger than that, isn't it? Because in the Greek it is I am. I am. We've heard that phrase, haven't we? When a bush burning in the desert started speaking to a shepherd (laughs) in Exodus 3. Ah, Hey, gentlemen, it's God here. Don't stress. Calm down. Uh, Literally, it's a good British phrase, be of good cheer. Again, I think we're so familiar with this that we are blunted to their significance. There's God walking next to you on the water. And it's not a tub at the front of a church that's flat, is it? It's a storm that has stalled fishermen. God himself is reassuring you as he stands in the flesh on the waves. Uh, Peter Grasser does it. I love Peter. 
Uh, Peter's the kind of guy who puts his mouth into gear before the brain kind of gets into gear. But the language is so wonderful, isn't it? Look at verse 28. Lord, if it's you, he's still doubting. I I just don't know if it is. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, command me to come to you on the water. And what does Jesus do? Go and do another theological course. Wait till next week. Get some training and read your Bible. No, what, what does Jesus say? Verse 29, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out. And Peter can't believe his eyes or his ears. He can't actually quite grasp what he sees and what he hears. But he calls out, if you're really Jesus, tell me to come. Jesus says, come. And again, we're dull to this. Peter walks on water. Peter walks on water. We get so caught up with the fact that Peter sinks that we forget that he walked. Jesus commands, Peter obeys, then he walks. It's almost like one of those things. You know how kids try, they're walking, they're looking at mum and dad and they're focusing on mum and dad and then they suddenly notice the lounge room and they go, oh, this is a bit big and they fall over when they're staying to learn. He loses his focus. The wind beats him. The waves start dripping on him. He doubts and he sinks. And what does Jesus do? Look at what Jesus does. Peter cries out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Do you think Jesus couldn't have just gone, hey, Peter, just get on the water? He he didn't need to touch him, did he? But he did touch him. How reassuring. Uh, what, What kind of king does that? And then Peter hears words that rebuke him. Again, the present tense there. It's in the foreground. Why did you doubt me, Peter? Why did you waver? If I really am who I am, then why are you fearful? Uh, Jesus doesn't just keep walking at that point, does he? Do you notice what he does? He could (laughs) have. He just hops in the boat. And as God, he hops in the boat and then everything stops. What a gesture. That's pretty kind, isn't it, to hop in the boat? And look at their conclusion, verse 33. Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, truly you are the Son of God. Again, I don't think we grasp how significant that is because Jews only worship God, don't they? (laughs) And yet here's a bloke who's salty, who's tired, who's in flesh, and they throw themselves down in front of him. They give him all that they can give where they are. Now, before we go further and deal with that last little section, let me just draw those threads out. Jesus is divine, isn't he? He's the son of God. And do you notice that both his actions and his words do that? Walks on water, I am. They recognise that. You are the son of God. His actions have displayed that. He saw them at 3 a.m. on a hilltop on his own in the pitch black out on a lake in a storm. That's miraculous, isn't it? And then he walks to them. He calms them. He enables Peter. He rebukes Peter and the storm stops. This bloke is God in the flesh. And how does he use his power? That's the second threat. How does he use his power? He uses it gently and wisely and obediently. He's not extravagant. He doesn't moonwalk backwards up the waves, does he? Come, reaches out. It's me. Calm down. I'll hop in the boat. Why do you doubt? That's a wise use of power, isn't it? A gentle use of power. He is awesomely powerful. And then he reaches out and grabs Peter and says, mate, why did you doubt me? And the realisation of the men is immediate. In Matthew chapter 8, when the storm is calm, they're scratching their head going, who's this bloke? In Matthew chapter 14, they go, who is this man? And they bow. They reach the shore. I'm at point four on the outline. Look at verse 34. Once they crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. 
When the men of that place recognized him, they alerted the whole vicinity and brought to him all who were sick. They were begging him that they might only touch the tassel on his robe, and as many as touched it were made perfectly well. They land, everyone recognises Jesus, the news spreads, everyone comes. Uh, They implore him. 36, again, present tense, it's brought right to the front. It kind of stands out in hypercolour, neon. Just let us touch the edge of your robes. What happens when you touch the edge of Jesus' robes? Did you notice that there? You are made perfectly well. Just his presence makes the world perfect. Just Jesus standing there changes everything. He's the Son of God who has come to deal with the outsider. Remember that question we began with? Who is Jesus? When was the last time you just sat and asked yourself that? Pondered that. Who is Jesus? He's God's Son. What does that mean? It means he is God in the flesh. Everything in this passage says it clearly. He walks on water. He calms the storm. His mere presence makes broken people whole again. Only God does that. But do you notice there is no distance here? We like distant gods because then we can ignore them or replace them, can't we? Gods who are absent are gods we can replace. This God isn't absent, is he? He's God in the flesh who reaches out and grabs a mate by the arm. He's God in the flesh who hops into a boat of men rather than walks past them. He's God in the flesh who stands on the shore and his presence sets things perfectly right. So suppose the question that we then have to ask is, do you recognise him? Do you recognise this Jesus? If you do, there are some obvious questions that come, questions that have been highlighted in the passage for us. Do you worship him? Do you give him what he deserves, which is all of you, all of you? Do you listen to Jesus? Do you notice that with Peter? We get so caught up on the fact that he sinks that we fail to acknowledge that he listens. Jesus says, come, and what does Peter do? My fingerprints would be in the edge of the boat. Peter hops out of the boat doesn't he? He listens to Jesus because Jesus is enough. Do you implore Jesus? He's not distant. He's not absent. He's not unaware of what your week will look like. Do you come to him in desperation, knowing that his presence is will make everything perfect. Do you trust this Jesus? When he says, come, do you come? When he says, why don't you trust me? Do you pray about it? When he says, like he does to Matthew in Matthew 9, follow me, do you get up from the table? When he stands on the shore, do you come and implore him? Who is Jesus? He's God's son. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. It really is a remarkable passage that we are too familiar with. Father, by your spirit, help us to recognise this Jesus, not some other Jesus, Not some absent or distant God, but you in the flesh who walks in this world, whose mere presence changes everything. We pray this in his name. Amen.